Conversation with Ron McLean. Welcome to In Conversation. Today on the show, Jeremy Taggart and Jonathan Torrance, two really good friends who found stardom earlier in their show business careers. 17 years old was Jeremy Taggart when he applied for and got the gig as the drummer for Our Lady Peace. That band debuted in 1994. Their first album came out, and by 97, their second, Clumsy, was one of the greatest selling albums ever. In fact, this is Bob Merceau's 100 Canadian albums, Best Ever. Now, this was published in 07, so obviously it's pre Drake and Bieber and Mendez and The Weeknd, but still, it's in the top 100 albums ever. And not only were they great musically, they were telegenic and creative. Their videos were terrific. Much Music awarded them more prizes, more video awards than any Canadian band in history. And on the other side, Jonathan Torrens was also just a kid around 17 when he started working on CBC's Street Sense. And from there, he morphed into Jonavision, which was a great talk show for teens. And then he kind of did the 180. After having been this little angel to tell us how to be, he became J-Rock on the Trailer Park Boys. And that was a, a massive hit, as you know, for a decade and a half. And he's also been on Mr. D and TV with TV's Jonathan Torrens and just too many shows to mention. He's ubiquitous, but everything that he ever does is fantastic. Both of them are a JT, and they love to have fun. And it got me thinking of another JT, not John Tavares, the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. When Justin's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, passed in 2000, I was working the Olympic Games in Sydney, and Justin was working on his eulogy for Dad, watching the opening ceremony. And he was struck by all the flags in the stadium and how his father had connected with every country there and made Canada proud in each of those countries. And then he got a great compliment when he heard Richard Pound of our COC, second in command at the IOC, say something of Pierre Trudeau. He said he wasn't old long. And Justin really loved that. He remembered his dad blowing out his knee, stepping in a hole in the Caribbean in his mid-70s, and within months he was back skiing the Black Diamond Runs at Whistler. He was robust. He was youthful to the end. And these two JTs are like that for me. They're still pups. They're still only in their 40s. But they are looking at 50, and yet they remain youthful and robust. They are definitely boys who have remained younger than others. You selling? I'm Byron. You selling? I'm Byron. You selling? I'm We'd like to wrap up this week's show with a viewer letter. It's from Linda Mullen in Charlottetown, PEI. Hi, I'm Jonathan Torrance. Welcome to the show. Today we're bringing you the kind of musical circus that only comes along once in a lifetime. It's just like Woodstock, except shoes? it's only 30 minutes. Could you please make some noise for my man, J to the ROC, live and direct with Detroit Velvet Smooth, here live for you, so yo, J-Rock. Hell yeah! Coffee cups. What do you want for today? Ski boots. What do you want for today? Tearaway pants. You got it? I need it. You want it? I'll buy it. You what do you want for today? He's pirate. Phone lines are open. And here are the JTs. Jeremy's up at Lake Wilcox and Jonathan's in Nova Scotia. Beautiful heart love to Nova Scotia. And here's Canadianity. I didn't mention in the preamble, gents, that you're authors. And of course, we know you have a legendary podcast now. Am I allowed to call you Bods? Or is that? Yeah, you? sure. Oh, good. <laughs> so where to begin? I want to start with the, uh, you signed my copy, and I'm really grateful for that. 87, Jonathan. I, can Jeremy get away with that? Like, wouldn't that be Sidney Crosby's signature? That we're oh, looking hey. I'm going to guess that's a J7, isn't it? It is. I was doing that from 1993, but that's a JT with isn't, a 7 on it. Isn't that fantastic? That was so Sidney Crosby's things. ganking your style, Jeremy? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, actually, we'll go hockey for a short second here, because I do know, Jeremy, you got to Salt Lake City. That gold medal was 50 years in the making, and you got to experience it. So why don't you tell the viewer a little bit about that? Well, I, I mean, I was a friend of mine, John Kawaja, uh, the curler, uh, was nice enough to get me a ticket to sit in a corner. I think I was like 14 or 15 rows up. I was in kind of the root area where Gord Downey was, or just behind us. And uh, within, you know, Walter Gretzky was right there. And, just to see the game, but like, uh, it was so enjoyable, Ron, just the fact that the, you knew they were going to win and it was just continual and the pressure that they put on, it was just, uh, it was really probably one of the most, uh, it was, it, there wasn't a lot of uh, worry, but it was a, a very uh, enjoyable just to be there, to see the gold medal in America, to see all the Americas, Americans just getting all fired up. It was, it was spectacular. 
truly was. Bob Cole, one of his most beautiful calls ever as well. Stand up and cheer, Canada. You've waited 50 years. That's what he said. Jonathan, do you have a, a sporting event or a hockey game, a, a moment that stands out in terms of being a spectator? Aside from going to the Truro Bearcats games at the <laughs> rec in Truro, I mean, it's pretty hard to top those. Uh, all 300 of us that are there know what a special event that is on Saturday nights. Um, one of the coolest vantage point stories I've heard from the world of sports is a friend of mine as a Mountie and was on the roof of the barn in Vancouver when Sid scored the golden goal. And he said you could feel the energy of the building come up through his feet and all the way out through the top of his body. It wasn't my story to tell, but as far as like full body chills, you can imagine what that vantage point would have been like. Hey, one thing about, uh, I I'm calling my Mountie here. My dad was with the RCMP as a civilian member, but I'm calling that Mountie there that I gave dad upon his retirement, Heidi, of course, for Heidi Stevenson, nice. uh, which connects us to Cole Harbor. And uh, did you know her, Jonathan? I, I met her, we were there for uh, Hockey Day in Canada was staged in Halifax on Cole Harbor. And I met Heidi, at least on that occasion, and I think a couple of others. Did, did you ever intersect her? I didn't know her specifically, certainly knew people that did. And, you know, she's just spoken of with reverence, um, her commitment to community and to family and um, both in her uh, professional role and just as a human being it sounds like she's one of the cornerstones of the neighborhood um, I'm closer to Portapic in fact where I live we live just outside of Truro um, we certainly knew uh, you know some of the victims personally and it's it continues to be inconceivable yeah it's been quite a few weeks out here uh, you know, I, I think of this is uh, Bruce Marie Ann's brother. They're all uh, stationed there most of the year now. Uh, Bruce and Corinne still live in Toronto as well. But uh, this is a book he put out on Pau Bellavo. I don't know if you know, but uh, the Murrays are descendants of uh, the Bellavo family that is Jean Bellavo, the great hockey players. Wow. Family. Yeah, it's crazy. I didn't and this know is that. the story of the Acadians and the Exodus and how uh, they. You know, it was basically ethnic cleansing up here. And, and then they came back, thankfully. And that's why we had Jean Bellavo. But it talks about Antonin Mayette and it talks about that spirit of uh, the Maritimes and, and laughter, believe it or not. Even in the, in the chaotic, you know, they were imprisoned, they were displaced. Um, and you've been kind of, a, you know, healing a little bit with uh, some levity along the way. And do you think that's sort of a secret of that part of the world or is that just... Human. I do. I, I, the expectations are so low here. And I think when you keep the bar manageable, that way you're not disappointed. We have a long and proud history here of having to go away to work. We don't come from much. I was talking about this with my in-laws last night, how the poor people used to eat lobster because it was the only food they could literally get their hands on mm -hmm. by wading out into the ocean. So disappointment is kind of woven into the fabric of the people that come from here. And I do think a, a healthy sense of humor helps to offset that, um, you know, laughter and, and music and community. Those are kind of the three things that we're known for here. And at a time when we can't be physically close, I think that's added layers to um, the challenge of grieving something like this. Um, and of course, Dylan Ehler, the three-year-old boy from Truro, mm -hmm. who is, has been missing for the past week. It just seems like the hits keep on coming. But um, I don't have to tell you, Ron, you spent a lot of time out here, the number of Nova Scotia flags and um, hearts that people have built and painted to put on their front lawn. Like it, the heart is strongest in the places it's been the most broken, as is often the case. And uh, there's a lot of pride here. And, um, you know, we, we will rebound for sure. Do you want in on that, Jeremy? Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, it's just... The wit to witness how this country has been dealing. I mean, this is kind of life unknown for just the situation we've been put in by being in quarantine for this long. It, our perspective, uh, it becomes so insular. And, and uh, when events like this happen on top of it, um, it, it really is uh, incredible to see the outpouring of, of community support and uh, the, the the amount of people that are willing to come forward and do whatever they can to see if they can uh, make anything better. I, I really, I see it uh, uh, in my community. I see it when I go out to get groceries. Um, just everybody is working together in a different way and there's a lot of uncertainty and love is kind of the only, and ser love and service seem to be the only things that are uh, the best way out of all this. You were so good on your last episode uh, of the podcast talking about service, Jeremy, and I, I just thought that was, uh, was fantastic. Uh, there's a lot about that podcast that was great. The opening skit on the 
egg-shaped planet. Rain Genius. down. Wasn't that unbelievable? Thinkton, uh, I mean, honestly, uh, you don't suffer fuels gladly. I, that was my best attempt to, to join that conversation. So just your love of wordplay, Jonathan, tell me where that started. Well, you're one to talk. I can still yeah. harken back to, there was some, it was a long walk that you took with Don, but landed back at, I think it was around the annual celebration of Canadian TV, and it had something to do with uh, stones, and you somehow walked it back to Gem in I around the time of the Gemini Awards. Oh, like, it's right. probably the mid 90s that you made this joke and it's stuck with me since then um some people say that puns are the domain of the dim-witted i happen to beg to differ i think it's it's fun and it's silly and it's it's my sudoku yeah. is that how you feel about it i well i heard shakespeare liked them so if it's good enough for shakespeare we're okay <laughs> but i right. do sometimes i feel bad about it i do feel kind of a, a notch below with that silliness um so that of course leads me to the song that that's the highlight of the end you announced june 11th the album's coming out but your latest uh you selling i'm byron is classic and i'm sure we'll intersperse a bit of this in the in the show as it goes but Whose idea? And honestly, Jeremy, you start because uh, your role is is fabulous at the at the tail end. <laughs> let me read you a quote. Let me before we uh, let me read you a quote from uh, Neil Peart, another great drummer. If I can find his book, this is what I thought of when I saw Jeremy and you sell and I'm Byron. This is the quote that starts Neil Peart's Roadshow book: "The music business is a cruel and shallow money trench, a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free, good men die like dogs." There's also a negative side. That's uh, attributed to <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. But that's, that's you, Jeremy, in that video, the you selling on Byron. Uh, tell me about that one and the album. Well, for some reason, my computer is going mad right now. I'm going to have to let Jonathan start. Okay. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll accept that. Um, Go ahead, Jonathan. We started the podcast five or six years ago and it has a lot of improvised sketches. So when we were uh, lucky enough to be able to do a record for Dine Alone, we thought that each of the characters on the podcast should be responsible for bringing their uh, one song to the record. So it is a tapas platter of different genres. There's country, there's EDM, there's spoken word, there's uh, pop. There's a Gino Vanelli sound alike song. Um, there's something you might hear at the Legion in Glace Bay on a Saturday night. Uh, so this uh, You Byron I'm Selling is from, I think it was called Swap Shop when I grew up in PEI. People would call in and say, yes, I have a pair of boys size seven micron skates. Um, looking to trade for a pan of squares. Like people had very specific terms that they were, it was like the penny saver, but on the radio. So this uh, You Byron I'm Selling, what do you want for that? Is what the call-in show is uh, called. So this is Byron's contribution to the album. And how did you create your look for it, Jeremy? Well, I, and, and I have to kind of go back a tiny bit, but the, the idea of this song, um, it's just the, the swap shop idea. And I guess kind of the, you know, how modern pop and hip hop has just been so kind of, uh, it's gotten to almost like limericks and rhymes. So this kind of, that this was the idea of the song style we were going for was kind of just like a very modern and simple uh, idea, but like the what do you want for that idea of the show and just items being so random and Canadian in a sense kind of ties everything together. But for my look, I was just kind of going for uh, Byron's hype man, if you will. Like if someone's second, you know, maybe questioning the, 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 the price that he's giving, I, I could be the person that comes in and just kind of, you know, sweetens it for for uh, for Byron. So yeah, and I'm not a clearance rack at Randy River kind of vibe. Definitely. Oh, it's just man. yeah, it's magic okay. to watch. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we always used to say you got the touch when when you score a goal. We'd one hand to the other, just that way. Mm -hmm. So magic. Hey, I'm going to bring in a special guest to join me for a, a good portion of this conversation. Uh, she knows you each, and she's the reason that we had you on Rogers Hometown Hawks. Funny, I just watched Joaquin Phoenix in The Joker. Finally saw it. And it's all these clowns, and I've had nightmares for four or five nights in a row. But you were on Rogers Hometown Hockey at the River Breeze Fear uh, display for Halloween, and it was, where are you? Is he, is he, um, I need my other uh, helper here. Yeah. There, here, there it comes. There you she got is. It. Hey. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Hey. How's it going, bud? You know the old expression, we went to different schools together? That is actually the case with Tara and I. We both grew up in Halifax. Um, I was in French immersion, so I went to a different junior high, but we sort of orbited in similar galaxies. So I, I was certainly aware of you in junior high, right? 
I no, well, we, we met. Yeah, we went. We met. I think through mutual friends because you were part of the music set, and I was a musician singer. So, yes, we met a few times, and yeah. Um, but yeah, we uh, we kind of got to know each other a little bit better post high school. But yes, and I know Tara from being on tour and opening for OLP, like in the states and all over the place for sure. Great times. That's right. In the Cuddy Sark bus. Yeah, that's right. The Cuddy Sark whiskey. The Cuddy yeah. Sark that was whiskey a good, tour. That was well, a good that, deal. That was Neil Peart's, uh, you know, salvation was after the show, he could have some scotch. Um, Tara, you know, I, you wanted to mention a little bit what, uh, and we've touched on a slightly the, the role he's played in, in trying to cope is all I can use as, as a word uh, for what Nova Scotia has been through mm -hmm. here. But you, you really, you, you follow Jonathan on his, on his social platforms and so do I, but I, I know that was important to you to kind of speak up about him. Yeah, I, well, I guess this is a good time and place to express my gratitude. I think, you know, there have been some people certainly in my sphere who have really stood out during this whole time. I mean, Jonathan, you're an excellent follow at any time on Twitter. Um, but I think in particular right now, and Ron, you said you, you touched on this in terms of, you know, having, adding some levity to the situation, but obviously with what's happened in Nova Scotia, Jonathan, um, there is some darkness and, and you acknowledge that and express it so deeply and beautifully with your heart. Um, the vigil was just heartbreaking and heart wrenching, but you also, every day, I think you, you seem to just take the time to add some lightness to this situation. And I was, so I would encourage anybody who doesn't follow you already on Twitter and, and you too, Jeremy. Um, but I just so appreciate that about you. I, I, I just think it's a really lovely ray of sunshine in, in these often dark days. That's so nice of you to say. It's, um, it's a, a tricky thing in this part of the world. No one likes to be perceived to be showing off or getting above their raisin. I, it's, it's not something uh, I, I didn't want to make myself the story, but it, it's so rare that my particular set of skills come into play out in the country, a place where people barter services, right? You do my electrical, I'll do your plumbing. Nobody needs any hosting done. So unfortunately, at this time, this was something I could actually lend um, my skills to. So as someone said, it was the greatest thing I wish we never had to do. And um, I did a meeting a few years ago with the Domino's franchise, 9,000 GMs and franchisees from all over the world. And uh, I was talking with the head of PR for Domino's worldwide. Um, and it was, I can't remember what the story was uh, that had happened in the world, but it was involving a toddler and it was really sad. He said, it's okay to be sad at sad things. And I think at some, sometimes we're trying to be so stoic or think of just the right turn of phrase uh, when these things happen. And I think it's okay to just say, this sucks and it's okay to be sad and it would be weird if we weren't sad. So um, though it was in some ways maybe too, too soon because it was mere days after this event, I think it gave us a, a space and an opportunity to just let it out because it was tension on top of tension, right? There, it was a lockdown because of COVID and then a lockdown in our community because of uh, this thing as it was unfolding. It's, it is almost too much to bear. So um, to use a, a gross expression to give people an opportunity to lance the boil of tension and just kind of exhale a little bit, um, I think it was really important. Uh this is Joel Plaskett, uh, and when uh, Thrush Hermit was coming through Toronto towards the end of that band's run, uh, he was asked, what would you like the band's legacy to be? Because he knew he was going to be moving on. And Joel Plaskett said, uh, I'd like us to be remembered as thinkers. We sometimes overthought things, but we were always thinking. And sometimes the thinking worked against us, and sometimes it worked for us. But I think a lot of bands just don't think. Uh, Jeremy, when you hear that, uh, what do you think? Yeah. I think the worst thing about <clears throat> that happens to bands, especially as successful early, they start to second guess their instincts. And uh, to me, the best bands were the ones that never sounded like anybody and did what they did, like Radiohead, for example. You know, you know who they are. Um, but a lot of bands, for some reason, they'll get success and then all of a sudden they'll start listening to the people at their record company or people around them saying, you know, you want to hit for a specific reason and they're willing to, or they're, they're they want to 
be number one and uh, because they had a taste of it and they start to to take advantage or not or you know water down their actual instincts and it actually can kill a band and it's killed a lot of careers uh trying to chase something that's not internal you know are you want to pick up on that either chasing dreams or uh, altering your dreams once you've got somebody saying, here's how to make an extra dollar. Oh my God. How much time do you have? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, in, what this brings up for me is um, I just, what I wish in retrospect in terms of my musical career and probably my whole career is that yes, that I trusted my instincts more as I was going along for sure. There's some, some outside feedback that altered the course of, of our trajectory that, in a really negative way. Um, but also just like the moment to moment appreciation of what's happening. I feel like I lived a dream and only remembered it when it was over. And to me, that's sort of sad because it doesn't, you don't take the time. I didn't take the time to recognize some of the, the nice moments and accomplishments. So that's maybe a little bit off track, but. No, it's perfect. Can I ask you the same question, Ron? What gives you kicks? Um, well, for sure, the free thinking. You know, I, I, like I don't necessarily go to the NHL personnel as an insider and get scoops. So for me, it's trying to craft a little story to open the show or to connect or bridge the show. That, that's probably the biggest thing is story. Say. And that's, you know, what you were saying earlier, nobody needs a host down in the Maritimes. <laughs> I go down there. <laughs> God, I feel utterly inadequate. I don't care if I'm at my uh, family's get together. Everybody's got a better storytelling ability than I do, right? It's As just, my buddy you know, Steve said, that's why the Yuck Yucks closed in St. John's because the hecklers were better than anybody on stage. Right. <laughs> Oh, I totally, totally, you know, and I, I'm, I haven't changed. That's the one thing, you know, like Jeremy, you know, he kind of had, a, he was dreaming of being a major league baseball player, but then kind of said, no. And then he was a, uh, you know, rock star. And then he said, no. And I just give you so much credit, Jeremy, for the, you know, cojones to pull up and do something different. Uh, trust your instinct, as you said. You, I think Jonathan. that's, yeah, go that's ahead, all I know. I, I only know that I can't do anything other. I think I'd fall on my face if I tried to do anything other than my instinct. <laughs> So in your case, Jonathan, I mean, honest to God, you, you're like an exploration of our industry. Uh, so I'll flip it back to you. You can either go music, you can go showbiz, uh, you can take it any which way you want, but uh, you've dabbled uh, and you've, I'd say you're, you're, you're ubiquitous and fantastic at everything, which is, a, which is a real compliment, of course, but how, how do you do that? Well, it's very kind of you to say, I think I've discovered one of the hardest questions I find to answer is what do you do for a living? Because the truth is I do a little bit of everything. And maybe that's because of my maritime roots and you had to do that to survive. Or maybe it's because I don't excel at any one thing, but I think my best virtue is that I'm in a small group of people that do a little bit of everything. And I learned that from going to the States. They want to know, are you a sitcom performer or are you a host? Because you can't be both. I always say, are you Seacrest or Schwimmer? Yeah. And in Canada, you can and indeed have to be both because otherwise you wouldn't survive. So I think it's maybe my short attention span that has... Um, allowed me to kind of pursue all these different flights of fancy, just never saying no, being open. But in all seriousness, uh, do you have like your performance in Degrassi Next Generation, which is a pretty cool role you played there. Uh, do you have a standout moment? Would it be uh, Y2K? You know, we went through a crazy, those of us who are old enough remember Y2K, we thought the world was going to be put on hold. Ron, Didn't I have... rehearsed my opening spiel when Mansbridge threw to me, because this was my moment to appear credible in a news context, because I was a kid's TV show host, as you know. You appeared on John Vision, you were kind enough to give us your time back then. So I rehearsed this, uh, Peter, the eyes of the nation turn now to Charlottetown, its birthplace, the little island with the big heart cradled in the waves of the Atlantic Ocean, where tonight some 10,000 memorized it, rehearsed it, worked on inflection, really planned. Peter threw to me in Charlottetown, we go to Jonathan Torrance now in Charlottetown, and I said, Peter, <laughs> oh. Didn't even get his first name out properly, oh. which I think is maybe a great lesson in this business. Have a plan, but know that the wheels will come off the bus and it's how you recover that is going to yeah. be your... And you story. did. And you did. And besides, we call him Peter Mansfred on Hockey Night in Canada. Not me, <laughs> but that's what we called him. Okay, last thing here. Uh, maybe it's not the last, but uh, I wanted Tara to tell you this story because you've got two daughters, Jonathan. Uh, you both speak glowingly of uh, the women in your lives. I mean, Jeremy, your grandmother didn't get to see uh, the album come out, but she knew you'd made it before. And that's great. So 
because you, why don't you start with your grandmother and the, and the role of her in, in your story. And then Tara, you tell your grandmother's story and, and then we'll go to Jonathan. Jeremy first. Yeah, um, well, my, my grandmother passed away just as I was starting to um, get into OLP. Um, we, we had just got signed, so I at least got to tell her that we were signed and we were going to be doing things. Um, but she was kind of the matriarch of our family, uh, the tastemaker, if you will, of everything. Uh, she was very strict. Uh, uh, she was big on etiquette and big on uh, loyalty. So um, she, for some reason, when I told her, she's like, don't worry, this is going to be huge. So I'm like, perfect. I'm in, Grandma. Tara, your story is a lovely one for someone to hear. Oh, boy. Okay. I'll, well, I'll try to make it short. Um, I feel really lucky in that I had a very close relationship with my grandparents. My, I was, uh, yeah, I lived close to, to them for many years. So the story that I tell often um, is about my grandmother, Phyllis Sloan. She was born Phyllis Gold. Her parents were uh, from Bessarabia and Latvia. They were Ukrainian, Eastern European Jews who came to Montreal. Um, my grandmother had uh, a twin brother, an older brother and an older sister. And at that time when she was growing up, there was a quota on Jews at many um, higher learning institutions, including McGill University. So my, my grandmother was a very bright woman and she actually applied to McGill University and got in, which was very difficult given the, the quota on Jews. She actually wasn't allowed to go. Her father thought that that was not a, the academic route was not one becoming a woman. So she went to teacher's college and, and became a teacher until she had children, which is an honorable profession, but it was not her profession of choice. Her older brother had also applied to McGill. He did not get in because of the quota on Jews. He went to the University of Montreal, went to Queens, subsequently um, became a lawyer, became a judge, went on to become the Chief Justice of the Superior Court of Quebec, So, which also for a Jew was a really, bi really big deal. His name was Alan Gold. And at every family function without fail, Alan would say and acknowledge that his sister Phyllis was the smartest one in the family. Hmm. And so I always think about her um, I acknowledge the, the privilege that I have in the freedoms that I have been given for many different reasons. And I, I get to do what I want and, and I've, I've done a lot of different things. And I think about her because she had a, a lovely, happy life, but she didn't get to do what she wanted for a lot of reasons. And most of all, because she was a woman. And so I acknowledge her, I pay homage to her and, and I think about her and I appreciate her. Nice, huh, Jonathan? How about, you yeah. know, obviously you're- I'm your not going to follow that. Yes. <laughs> well, you I called- I follow that. You called your mom Dennis and Reggie. You were very yes, respectful. <laughs> and uh, I, I like to tease her by calling her Dennis. And it was funny at first. And then it stopped being funny. It was just what everyone called her. Where are we going to Dennis's for Thanksgiving? Have you seen Dennis? I'm going to pick up Dennis around. You spread it to everybody else? Everyone just casually called her Dennis. It was a non sequitur. And no one knew why. And I didn't realize that she didn't like it. And in a very high stakes cribbage game, she said, uh, if I win, you promise you'll never call me Dennis ever again. And I said, okay, but if I win, I will never call you mom for the rest of your life. So she said, bring it on. She skunked me, could never call her Dennis again. That was the end of Dennis. So I waited two weeks and started calling her Reggie. Not well, listen, nearly as eloquent or beautiful as what Tara just said, but no. maybe more on brand. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> brand command. I'm reading a book called that right now, which is doing me no good. Um, we'll close with, Tara and I were with Matt Mays when we did the Rogers Hometown Stop intro, and that was the one you appeared on, which was great. Uh, and him playing Swingin' by Tom Petty was one of the highlights of my life. Um, but you know, you two connected uh, with Matt Mays at a bash, and that, that's kind of the uh, beginning of the podcast and the beginning of Canadianity. So let's let's finish with that. You know, and maybe just also, you two, how uh, Our Lady Peace had Trailer Park Boys on tour. That that's amazing. If the viewer, yeah, well, on the on the Gravity tour, um, I thought it would be a great idea to have because the show was, I believe, in its second season and was already funny. Our sound engineer. Tim Murray had worked with 
Mike Smith previously when he was in Sandbox. So there was a history there as well. So um, I, I uh, thought it would be great to have them host the Gravity Tour, and they did. And Mike Clattenburg came with them, and they film stuff to this day. There's like a, a an actual episode called Peace in the Park that never probably won't ever come out, but it was really funny, like bubbles stealing shopping carts from the West Coast because they don't have them in Nova Scotia and just ridiculous stuff like that. But getting to know them and hanging out with them, uh, I got to know Jonathan. And uh, we were playing a show uh, a couple years later in PEI. And uh, after the show, uh, Jonathan and, and I got together to go walk around and hang out and we ran into Adam Baldwin and Matt Mays and those guys and we ended up at a house party and there's like a band in there and I decided I'll sit in but the drums were left-handed but I played them anyway and it was fine we had a great night <laughs> yeah that's that's it I was asking because uh, Tara's Tony is uh, left-handed Tony right? fantastic so old friend yes a great yeah. drummer yeah and and just maybe uh, Jonathan to to close with you so that oh look who's that what do you got and there? Joy this is Joy oh Luke that's Joy is going to be 180 house. pounds right yeah she's a Leon Burger <laughs> oh my she's god gigantic Joy gigantic so but yeah your your thought on I mean you used to go Bubbles would start the uh, imagine you go to a rock concert to see Our Lady Peace and all of a sudden these guys come out on stage and what would he do he Bubbles would say knock knock. Yeah, knock, yep. knock, who's there, F off. But people forget now, <laughs> given how far the show has traveled and continues to, thanks to Netflix, it's in every territory in the world now. And there are teenage boys in Oslo saying, Bobbles, which is so inconceivable yeah. because it was so regionally funny. And Tara knows this. It, it was extremely Dartmouth. And we thought maybe people in Halifax will find it funny. Like it was so local. So hard to believe it's traveled as far as it had. But when it came out, it landed with a thud. People didn't know what it was. They thought it was a documentary, not a mockumentary, uh, especially in the States on BBC America. The swearing was bleeped. So imagine trying to figure out what a Trailer Park Boys episode was about with the swearing bleeped. Um, <laughs> so it took bands like The Hip and Rush and OLP especially getting behind the show and suddenly teams were passing DVDs around on buses um, to bring it back from life support. But it was on the way out. How changed is show business as a result of COVID-19, Jonathan? Uh, you and Jeremy were chatting a little bit about side access concerts and just what do you think, you know, even the late night shows coming to you from, you know, with a t-shirt and someone's house? I what's, know. What's happening? Um, well, obviously, uh, it's hard to gather in any great numbers. So we had a huge production slate lined up for uh, Nova Scotia for this summer. That's all sort of pending. I've heard um, worst case scenario, we can't resume production until there's a vaccine which is obviously a really long time away. Best case scenario, I got sent a flyer for an eight station hand washing trailer. So maybe optimists are trying to figure out a way this could work, but it's a very intimate process for the performers and the crew. Um, someone's pulling your focus, hovering over your shoulder. It's hard to do that from six feet away. Um, but I think the great thing, the upside to this is that technology is the great equalizer in some ways. One epiphany I had is that at this moment, the consumers are deciding what gets consumed as opposed to people at the networks deciding whether they're going to roll the dice on something or not. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of content. There's a lot for people to consume, but the good stuff is having a chance to rise above the din and everyone's technology and budget is the exact same. It's your phone. So I think ultimately that could be great. It's fascinating, right? No gatekeepers. Uh, Jeremy, you want to close on that thought? And then Tara, you tell us what you're up to, too. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's fantastic in a sense. I mean, look at this. I mean, I love what you bring to everybody weekly with hockey, and it's only five minutes or little snaps. And this is, you know, this is your strength where you can deep dive into any aspect of, of, of someone's life. I mean, this this is a product of, of COVID is this show that we're on right now. And I think it's something that's great. And this is, these are a, a few examples of the silver lining that, that is happening is everybody's kind of forced to dig down and do what they do best. And, and uh, there's a, that's, that's what's I think the positive outlook on it, but uh, there are some great things that are, that are happening because of also it. in an LOL emoji universe, isn't it nice to finish a sentence? Right. No one's in a rush. You can actually yes. have a conversation and exactly. you to think about what you think about something instead of writing back 
immediately. It's kind of well, nice. It's funny, John. I've been trying to trying to keep it to around 20, 25 minutes, just knowing our attention spans were shot. But I think that's changed. I think we were initially, you know, scrambling for the news. And now we're just waiting for that vaccine. Like you said, Tara, you got some ideas happening. So do you want to enlighten? Um, what am I up to? Well, I mean, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say that I missed uh, hometown hockey and, mm. and pray that it comes back in some form because like everybody, the, the rug gets pulled out and, um, you know, it's, that was sad for us. So I miss you on Sundays, Ron. Um, Monday mornings, I'm doing a guided meditation with a guest instructor most of the time, although this week it didn't work, but a guided meditation, meditation for people who can't sit still, and that's on my Instagram live page. So short instruction and practice. And then stay tuned to uh, Sportsnet. We have some stuff in the works, in development. I can't, I guess I can't say it yet. But. <laughs> Well, can I just say, as far as Canadianity goes, what you guys are doing with hometown hockey is yeah. it's yeah. everything. Hockey is obviously a huge Canadian pastime, but the heart that you're bringing is so moving and the stories that you're telling, they really do matter to these communities. And Jared and I feel as viewers that um, we really hope it comes back too, because it, it's a real yeah. treat and something we look forward to all week. Hey, let's close with a knock, knock joke. Knock, knock. Who's, Who's there? there? Byron. Byron, who? Byron shows over. <laughs> Ronovision. That's the show Canada needs. Dad jokes. Again, a huge thanks to Tara joining us and, of course, to Jeremy and Jonathan. We're back Friday. Michael Medline is in charge of Empire Group, so that's grocery stores across Canada. They are a key cog in the running of our lives these days. And Bob Nicholson, the chair of the Edmonton Oilers Hockey Club, Friday 70 T for Pacific. We close with a song lyric from Taggart and Torns. You got some shoes, you got some scissors, you got tires and a coat for a blizzard. You selling, I'm Byron. So long for now.